Welcome to virology, the most interesting subject in the history of the universe, I think, anyway. Um, those of you I recognize from molecular biology know that I'm ever so slightly biased. So we are actually going to talk about most of the things that are shown on this particular slide here, which is always going to be my entry slide. Uh, this is a virus that's very near and dear to me because I was the person who actually discovered this virus in a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. This is the SSV virus. Um, some of you sitting up at the front may recognize my 3D printed model of this. Um, main focus of the work that goes on in my lab. There are some really fascinating plant viruses that we won't have much of a chance to talk about here. This is bacteriophage T4 and sort of you know, viruses in space. We may get a chance to talk about this. And again, those of you who are in molecular, you may remember the what are the killer alien viruses, I think. Um, and then this is adenovirus that we'll talk about a little bit more later on. Um, where do you find me? Oh, listen, I'm getting infected, it looks like, over here. Uh, 466 SRTC, that's uh, building previously known as Science Building 2. Any of you remember when it was still called Science Building 2? Couple of you, okay. You've been here at least partly as long as I have been. Um, office hours are going to be, excuse me, right after class. Um, either right here, if there's no class right after this, or over in my office, or walking back over in that general direction. Um, how many people have class right after this? Okay, a rather large number of you. Um, so, also, um, by appointment, anytime. Um, I'm usually here about 8.30 in the morning um, till 5.30 in the evening. Send me an email, we can try and set up some times. Unfortunately, as many of you may also know, I'm doing the mutant viruses from Hell Lab on Monday through Thursday afternoons, where people will be working on these viruses. Um, so it'll be hard to find during those times, but Tuesday and Thursday mornings actually are relatively flexible for me. Uh, best way to reach me is by email. I'm pretty email dependent. Uh, and you can try the D2L email. I may or may not get around to reading it. I usually don't notice it's there. But this one, I seem to be constantly on. If you want to talk to my voicemail, call this number. Um, want to see some of the things that we're doing in my lab, we do have a Facebook page. This is actually set up by my lab Facebook page. So um, I post stuff on there, cool virus stuff. More and more I've been getting into Twitter because it takes less time. And then as Again, all of you know from molecular. Every time I say molecular biology, you make a little mark. I think we got up to 54 once in one class. Uh, the YouTube channel that has all of my lectures on it is here. I'm trying to get a better address than this crazy thing right here. But uh, if you just go to YouTube and search for Ken Stedman, uh, my YouTube channel will come up. Uh, a couple of people have asked me about prerequisites for this class. I know I've talked to a few of you already. Um, I won't mention this name here because I'll say it too often for the rest of the class. Uh, but <clears throat> the official prerequisite for this is also cell biology. How many people have had cell biology? Okay, how many of you are taking cell biology now? A few of you as well. Um, anyone not had cell biology? A few of you. Okay. Um, it should not be a big problem, and I know I've talked to a couple of you already. There may be some sort of backfilling that you might want to do for some of the subcellular components and a little bit of intracellular transport, but it's pretty minimal relative to the molecular aspects of things because I assume that you've actually had molecular biology either with me or with Dr. Singer and a couple of cases I know other than that. But if you've got any real questions, um, please come talk to me after class. would be a good time um, other than anything else. So why am I so beating on this molecular biology? This is really a molecular virology class. Um, it's not about how viruses make you sick, although we will talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm much more interested and I feel much more confident about how viruses work. Um, and this is very much at a molecular kind of level rather than those boring hosts that, you know, who cares about the hosts. Um, so we will talk about some of the major classes of viruses. 10 weeks is nowhere near enough time to talk about all viruses. Um, we'll see later that people think there are 10 to the 31 
virus particles on this planet. We don't have 10 to the 31 seconds to talk about these things. So it's going to be pretty much an overview. And part of the idea is going to be sort of the comparisons between these various different viruses. And a great reason, again, one of the reasons I think that these viruses are so fascinating is sort of the contrast between everything that I talked about last term in molecular biology and what we know about how viruses replicate here. So we'll talk about DNA viruses, RNA viruses, and retroviruses, bacteriophage. Um, I'm a big fan of bacterial viruses, partly because those are the vast majority of viruses that are on this planet and maybe even associated with us and our microbiome, um, to HIV-1, and also my long-term favorite. Actually, uh, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but if you see a red Subaru Outback with this license plate, you know who's driving it. Um, <clears throat> but really important, again, for this class and every sort of lecture, we're going to be talking about different viruses here, is going to be about how the virus makes more of its genome, how it takes that genome and makes proteins from it, and then how it puts those proteins together. So for really every one of these sets of viruses, the DNA viruses, the RNA viruses, the retroviruses, SSV1, et cetera, we're going to be talking about all three of these different things, because these are the things that are really pretty unique as far as viruses are concerned. And yeah, we'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis, because some people care about how viruses make you sick. And actually, a lot is not known about how viruses make you sick. And that's part of the reason that I don't spend a huge amount of time talking about it. <clears throat> How do you do well in this course? You know, score very well on the exams. Uh, this is, should sound again really familiar for those of you who took my course last term. We've got two midterms, each of them 30% each, and a final, which is basically just like a third midterm. Um, these are the days for them, 23rd of April and the 16th of May. Um, these are regular class time, 9 to 10.05. And again, those of you who have been in my classes in the past, you know, you can have as long as you need for the exams. Most people finish in about half an hour. There are 50 multiple choice questions. The final is non-cumulative. will be Tuesday, 12th of June at 8 a.m. That's the standard exam time for this class period. Again, 50 multiple choice questions, Scantrons on the blue form. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples on D2L of all of these exams. All of you, I'm sure, have noticed, even though it's 9 o'clock in the morning and Monday and all that good stuff, um, 30 plus 30 plus 30 equals 90. So what are the other 10%? Those are clicker questions. Um, I've been doing clickers for a while. And again, those of you in my class last term, again, my apologies every time I say that, uh, know that I've been doing clickers for a while. And I'm slowly learning, I think, at least the best practices on how you're supposed to do clickers. And that means two rounds of clicker questions. So I start by asking a question, everyone gets to think about it by themselves, answer, then you get some time to talk about it with your neighbors, answer again, and then we go from there. Uh, that's really supposed to be about learning the material rather than getting the points. Uh, and usually my idea is that people should be getting the vast majority of clicker points for everything. Again, this will be 10% of your grade. They only start counting next week. Anyone not have clickers? OK, not very many of you. So um, we can, um, any device will work. I don't like people using their phones because you can have your notes on your phones, et cetera. Um, so any device is fine. And I'm going to try and have some clickers on reserve in the library. So if you get here in the morning and you're like, uh-oh, I forgot my clicker at home. You can go and check one out for two hours. And then just let me know which one that is. Um, and I'll try and take those over there after class today. Uh, register on D2L. Hopefully, most of those will automatically carry over. Those of you who already have them, um, we'll do a click, quick clicker question here in just a second so you can pull them out, um, just so you can see that they're being recorded appropriately. But make sure they get registered by the first midterm. So. I'm interested in some information about you, so um, please answer this clicker question, which and I've been told I shouldn't read them, but some people like me to read them. So um, which of the following best describes you, junior biology major, senior biology major, post back, junior, senior, non-biology major, or none of the above? Um, and we'll start here. And then again, you know, we're going to do a minute. You can you know, make your own decision. 
and then we'll stop and you can tell your neighbors what you answered and then we can go from there. We're on AA, yes. <laughs> and you know, some of you probably know this information already, but just sort of get used to the, the general idea here, right? I know there are more than 27 people here with clickers. A lot of you didn't raise your hands and not having clickers. Or maybe you didn't bring them today. Because <laughs> you thought that Stedman guy wasn't even going to ask you clicker questions. He's not mean enough to ask you on the first day. I guess my reputation hasn't, you know, traveled far enough yet. That, there they are, exactly. You've got those, those clicker questions are already there. Okay, so we've, we've had a minute. Um, talk to your neighbor. Tell them what you answered and why. Or if you didn't have a clicker question, <laughs> tell them what you would have answered if you'd brought a clicker. I'm going to try and get a link um, in D2L. Yeah, so if you've got that and can email it to me, that'd be great. Okay, has so everybody um, found out who their neighbor is? Probably should have told you to tell each other your names just in case you didn't know. Okay, we get to vote again and see if the numbers change. And this time you can tell each other what they should be voting for. So it turns out that everybody in this class is none of the above. No, but you, everyone, is, everyone will get a point for this, um, just for being here. I will post that on D2L, and that way you'll know that the registration has worked. And so that's the, the main reason for doing this today. Um, so we've got 27 people with clickers. Any more people with clickers? Have you all done your votes? Some of you changed your mind, which is interesting. Uh, <laughs> say, I have, I have no way of actually checking this, at least not for the clickers right now, because I don't know what the registrations are, and I'm not going to actually count these. Uh, but I can go through the list and see how well this reflects um, all of the rest of you. OK, so it looks like 27 people brought their clickers today. And there are certainly more than 27 people here. OK, so um, what are the results, just in case you were wondering? Uh, mostly senior biology majors. Nobody says none of the above. Um, we've got about 20% um, post backs, at least the people who brought their clickers. Um, so that gives you a bit of an idea of the distribution of people in the class. And um, those people who are not biology majors, I promise that I will be nice to you. Um, at least I'll pry to anyway. Um, so now let me close these. Okay, that's it for the clickers for now. Again, this is uh, what I've always done for my grading. Um, because there are going to be some ringers in there, all those junior biology majors who are going to get the high score in the class, um, I always normalize to that high score, whatever it is, and sometimes actually a few points less than that in terms of normalization. Um, so my curve, I'll set that, and then 90% of that is an A, 85% of that's an A minus, et cetera. Um, all the way down. And so I will let you know what the high score is on all of the exams. I'll let you know what the high scores are on the clickers. And you can just scale from there. It'll give you a bit of an idea where you stand letter grade wise. Uh, my policy about exams, again, this should be no surprise, closed book, no time limit. But because there's no time limit and I let people take their exams with them when they go, um, I'm not going to let people start exams after people have finished um, and left the room. So get here on time for your exams. One option is to get here and fall asleep during the exam. I had somebody last term who did this. No idea how you could do this. First time I've ever had anybody fall asleep 
during my exams. You know, lectures, yes, I understand that. But uh, <laughs> during exams, I thought this was pretty amazing. But yeah, as long as you get here, fine. You've got as long as you need. Um, if you have accommodations to the DRC, let me know and remind me before exams so I can make sure that that gets taken care of appropriately. Uh, makeup exams, life happens, um, particularly if you've got, I guess we're about 60 some, 63 or so have registered for this class. And so these things happen. We can do makeup exams. Um, there'll be essay exams, et cetera. Sometimes the Scantron has problems or you've marked something on the Scantron incorrectly. I scan all of those Scantrons as PDFs and so I can go back and look at them. So one of the reasons you get to take your exam with you is you can mark on there what those answers were and make sure that they actually correspond to the Scantron. So if you need to, <clears throat> you can go back and check those. So how do you do well on this course? Uh, basically, let's back up a little bit. My philosophy as far as teaching is concerned, and I don't think I did a very good job of talking about this last term, is that I'm here to try and help you learn, which is different than me trying to teach you. That, I think, is the completely wrong approach to things. I'm trying to help you learn the subject material. I'm really passionate about the subject material, as you've probably noticed, but it's really about helping you learn. It's not about trying to teach you. And so one of the ways that I think is very useful in terms of trying to learn the material is our textbook. Um, this one here, Fundamentals of Molecular Virology. You probably guess why I picked it. Again, molecular and virology here. Um, this is the second edition. Um, if you only can find the first edition, that's fine. Um, there's at least one chapter that we'll cover in the textbook, which is not um, in the first edition, is now in the second edition, particularly the viruses of Archaea, um, which we'll, uh, we'll definitely be talking about. Switch back here. Um, there are a couple of things that I really like about this textbook. The First one is these chapter overviews and key terms, which are present right at the beginning of each of the chapters. Great way to review the material which is in any given chapter. There's a very nice glossary at the back of the textbook and a number of references. I will be posting at least one version of the second edition in the library on reserve. I also have the first edition on reserve in the library as well. D2L. I post all the lecture notes. How many of you downloaded them already? So um, try and get them up by about 10 o'clock the night before. All the previous year's lecture notes are there as well. I'm modifying those. Last year's lecture recordings and this year's lecture recordings. Again, those of you who were in my course last term know that I've got this strange setup here and I'm trying to record my voice and what's on the screen. And those will all be posted to YouTube after class. And so you can go back and review and take a look at those. And then, of course, the very best way to A, slow me down, B, hopefully get a better understanding of things is to ask questions and lots and lots of questions. So are there any questions so far? Yeah? Um, I'm interested to know how you got into virology in the first place. How did I get into virology in the first place? I'll actually get back to that a little bit later on um, in the lecture today. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a convoluted story. And again, pardon me, a quote from last term, something I could probably spend all term talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, D2L. I'm not going to go to D2L right now. Um, hopefully, all of you should have access. I actually opened up access last week. So you should be able to take a look at that. Um, I already mentioned the lecture notes that will be there. The syllabus is also there, which has a reading list to give you a bit of an idea where we're going to be for any given time. All of my old examinations and keys are there, not as well organized as they probably should be. If there's something you're looking for there you can't find, please let me know. There's some extra readings. There's also the discussion forum, and I did want to emphasize this because it didn't get used that much last term, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, anytime anybody asks me a question over email, usually has something to do with something they didn't completely understand, they would like some more clarification, or you know, my personal history is the case may be, and 
anytime I get an answer that's not too ridiculously personal, I will post that on D2L. And I find that's really, really useful if you have a question, highly likely that one of the other people in the class or more than one of the other people in the class has that same question. And so I highly recommend going and checking out that question and answer. And if there are questions that are posted there, I also try and answer them. Um, but usually these are going to be questions that people have asked me via email that I will post answers to. Um, you can send me messages on D2L mail. I may or may not get around to reading them. I much more recommend that you send them to my PDX um, email address. How else do you do well in the class? Um, there are multiple other references. There's another textbook which I have used in the past called Principles of Virology. Um, it doesn't cover many of the bacteriophage, which I think are really important. That's part of the reason I don't use it. Um, but it's a really good reference text for animal viruses. And I will be putting the second edition on reserve in the library. I'm going to try and get the fourth edition as well. Um, one of the nice things about this text is there are lots of short videos and animations and things that are available on the website. And I will try and get you that website a bit later on. The I like to call this sort of the holy book of virology is called Fields Virology. Um, Fields Virology, I think, is four volumes and is about this thick. So if you're really interested in a particular virus, um, a great place to go and take a look at it. This is a very active field, um, Journal of Virology, Virology, Science, and Nature. I think we have access to all of these via the P PSU library. If not, there's something interesting you'd like to find there let me know. I have my own library. Um, I will loan things out. There's this big building with the books in it, you know, over on the other side of campus, and then um, office hours. I also wanted to mention that, as I talked about before with exams, um, life happens. And one of the things that I think that students often don't have a really good handle on, is there are a lot of resources here. Um, here at PSU. So if there is any major problem, and particularly um, mental health issues, it's stressful being in college. It's stressful being a faculty member in college. And one of my students actually has some pretty serious mental health problems. And so there are lots of resources to deal with that. I'm not qualified to do that, but I will try and link you to as many of these as I possibly can. Um, if there's any kind of crisis whatsoever, um, call the Office of Public Safety. Um, Shaq does a good job with counseling. The Dean of Student Life has a lot of student resources here at this link. Um, there's the Disability Resource Center, as I mentioned, but there's also a Women's Resource Center, which is not just for women. Um, Queer Resource Center, you name it. There are lots and lots of resources, um, just in case you want some help with anything that I particularly can't help with. And um, also 24-hour mental health crisis lines, et cetera. So yeah, it's a stressful time being in school and um, sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. So I just want to make sure that these are here. These are also in the syllabus which I've posted online. Mm, you can find tons of things about viruses online. One of the things that I find, again, in terms of me trying to help you learn is maybe skim through some of these things and find the ones that are real virology as opposed to fake virology. Um, so. <clears throat> One of the ones that I really like is Vincent Racaniello's blog. He's actually also one of the co-authors of that textbook that we're not using. So he keeps trying to convince me to use his textbook. I'm still resisting. Um, Vincent Racaniello um, also does a virology course not dissimilar to this one at Columbia. Also posts all of his lectures online on YouTube. So if you're interested in taking a look at that, I highly recommend doing so. I mean, it's actually his inspiration for me to record my lectures and post them online as well. Um, his lectures, however, have a different format, again, because he's kind of following his textbook. He talks more about replication, transcription, et cetera. So it's a nice complement, I think, to what we're talking about here. And he has a Coursera course as well. Another thing that Vincent Racaniello does, how the guy has time to do this, I have absolutely no idea. He's really inspirational. A podcast called TWIV, This Week in Virology. Um, great deal of fun. I learn basically something new every time that I listen to it. 
every week, and there are, I guess we're up to four other um, faculty members who basically get together and talk about the weather, um, but also about new, cool, interesting virus papers, and then a number of asides as well um, that go with it. It's a little on the longer side, so if you've got a good commute, you're washing dishes, actually I usually listen to it while I'm washing dishes, um, is <clears throat> a nice way to be sort of up to speed and just hear about some really fascinating viruses and how they replicate um, in terms of other aspects of things. So I have, I have a great appreciation for this. A few other websites here. Um, icosahedral viruses, we're going to spend quite a long time talking about icosahedral viruses and particularly icosahedral symmetry. Um, and there's a really nice website here that has lots of structures. One of the things I've asked people to do in the past is to make an icosahedral virus-like particle. Um, these are great models to do that. I can't grade 63 of these anymore, um, but it's a really nice useful site for that. Um, Edge of Life, the movie, was a documentary on viruses that gets a little bit of my personal history as well, um, that we've been trying to make for six years now. Um, still not quite there yet, but um, we've got some trailers. I'll probably force you to watch one of those trailers later on. Viral Zone, um, this is a website based, I think, out of Switzerland that basically has a nice overview of all of the different viruses. So any of the viruses we'll be talked about in class, you can go there and get a bit of an overview in terms of some of those particular viruses. And then finally, particularly in terms of bacteriophage, there was a really fun meeting, you know, birthday party meeting, 100 years of bacteriophage, bacterial phage being bacterial viruses, and all of the talks, including one of mine, um, are present at this website. A couple of fun things we'll be doing this term. Um, hopefully we'll have a couple of guest lectures. I know we'll have at least two, maybe as many as four. The first one is in fact going to be a postdoc from my lab, um, Ignacio de la Higuera, who's a Spanish postdoc, um, also goes by Nacho. We'll be talking about virus structure this Friday because I'll be in Western Oregon because my daughter made the state finals in the Geography B. So <laughs> that's what I'll be doing on Friday. Um, George Kaysen, who's a graduate student in my lab, um, who's also taking some teaching courses. Uh, we'll talk about single-stranded DNA viruses because that's the focus of the work that he's actually doing in my lab. He knows more about this than I do. And then Alec Hirsch, who's at OHSU, the Vaccine Gene Therapy Institute. I've asked to give a talk on flaviviruses, flaviviruses being Zika, yellow fever, dengue, and a few others. Um, and Ryan Estep, who is in fact a PSU grad, who's now working at OHSU, also at the Vaccine Gene Therapy Institute. Um, I've asked if he can come and give a, a herpes virus talk. So that's all I have in terms of overview for the class. So are there any questions about sort of how the class is supposed to run anything else at this point? No. I should also warn you that when these questions come up, I'm going to do also what I've been told is best practice. I'm just going to print out a list of everybody who's registered. And if I've got a subject matter question, I'm just going to go down that list at a random number and ask questions. So consider yourselves warned about that. OK. Nothing else? OK, so <clears throat> a little bit about viruses and really about um, what we're going to talk about today in terms of the introduction, which is basically sort of chapter one of the text, but a lot more which is there. Um, I'll try and have an outline at the beginning of each of my lectures, which is also, I think, a really useful tool for going back if you're trying to teach your neighbor about these or in your study group to review. Um, I think it's a very useful way of thinking about it. So we'll talk a little bit about what is a virus, some of the virus definitions. And the really key point here is virus, they don't have a nice not equal sign here, is not the same as a virion. So the virion is the extracellular particle part of the virus life cycle. And that hopefully is something I will, I'm still trying to beat into my own head um, relative to everything else. Why study viruses? This is kind of getting back to how I became a virologist. Um, viruses are everywhere and they're incredibly diverse, not just in terms of their sequences, but also in terms of, of how they replicate. Depending on where we get to, we may end up talking more about this on Wednesday. But the history of virology, 
where people originally started to think about viruses, a lot of that actually was vaccines. It turns out that vaccines were discovered um, before viruses were actually discovered, which is a really fascinating um, subject that people haven't talked too much about. And I will talk a lot about vaccines in this class and how wonderful they are. And if anyone has any more questions about vaccines, I'm more than happy to talk about that um, also offline. If you check my Twitter feed or my Facebook page, you will see that I'm also very, very pro-vaccine and um, against the pro-disease people. So um, also a little bit about pathogens. Yes, I'm not going to concentrate on pathogens for this course, but that's how viruses were found in the first place. They were really small pathogens. And that was originally some of the, the very first <clears throat> parts of the discovery of viruses. And then how we detect viruses and how we look at virus replication. So I'll start out with what's a virion. And again, this is something I will make this mistake throughout the rest of the course. I have 90 plus percent of virologists make this mistake as well. And I would say probably 99.9% .9 of the public will make this mistake, but none of you will, right? So <clears throat> a virion is the extracellular part. So this is a virion. It's not a virus. It's just a virion. This is a virion, also not a virus. This is a virion, also not a virus. It's the extracellular part of the virus life cycle. There are really two basic kinds of virions. There are enveloped ones, or non-enveloped ones, or naked ones. And so <clears throat> this is the example. We'll start over here on the right-hand side. This is a nice example of a naked virion, it's got nucleic acid, and a protein that's associated with that nucleic acid. So nucleic acid plus protein. That's what is the really fundamental unit of a virion. It's also called the capsid. So here, naked virion. I like to think of viruses as just, or say, see there you go, already. Virions as bags of nucleic acid. And here, the protein is sort of forming a bag around the nucleic acid. More common, and this is particularly true for a lot of the animal viruses that we'll talk about later on in the course, many of these viruses are enveloped. And all that envelope means is that there's a lipid membrane around the outside of this protein capsid in the middle. And again, always has a nucleic acid genome. Capsids around the outside, and then some cases, but not always, you'll have these envelopes. In these envelopes, you always have virus-specific proteins, these little lollipops. And we'll talk a lot more about these as we move on <clears throat> through the course. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Again, virus that I discovered, which I really like. Um, Ceci n'est pas un virus. This is Patrick Fortier, one of my colleagues at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, he, of course, is referring to this famous painting by René Magritte, Ceci n'est pas un pipe, which I went back and looked at last night and I've forgotten. Does anybody remember what the name of this actual painting is? It's not, this is not a pipe. I'll, I'll remember, I'll, I'll post it again later. But again, the, the story here is that this is just part of the virus life cycle. You know, this is not a virus, it's a virion. And here, you know, this is not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> how do people define viruses? And this is, again, we'll see, this here, a lot of the definitions that are sort of in the textbook, and we'll see which things I like or don't like as we move through them. So the standard one, and this, I think, is the one from the textbook, which is, a very small infectious obligate, obligate intracellular parasite that needs precursors, energy, translation, and membranes. Well, anytime Stedman puts something in quotes and puts it in red, what does he mean? Remember it? Actually, no. This is more um, things that he doesn't like particularly. So this is uh, the whole idea of very small. 
um, there are now virions which are larger than some bacteria, which is kind of mind-blowing, but again, this is, these were the original definitions of some of these things. Um, infectious, obligate, intracellular, I'm perfectly happy with. Parasite, less so. Um, the whole idea of parasite, I like to think of viruses much more like symbionts rather than parasites. Could be parasitic, many viruses are in fact rather parasitic, but some in fact are more mutualistic. And we'll talk about some of those examples um, later on through the course, also the good viruses, um, quote unquote. So what do they need to replicate? They need precursors and energy, also need translation. We'll see where we get to with that a little bit later on. Also has to do with it's very, very small. And if they are enveloped, they're using the cellular membranes. One other very important thing about virions is that unlike you think about cellular replication, where whenever you have cellular replication, there are bits of that cell. Every time you go from one cell to two cells, each of those cells is going to have something which they started with at the beginning. That's not the way that viruses replicate. So if you have a virion, that virion is never reused. And so it's sort of a one virion goes to zero virions, goes to many virions. And so it's not a one to two to four to eight, et cetera, process. Uh, DNA or RNA genome, so again, big red means most of the time, but not always. Um, so there are a couple of viruses that have combinations of DNA and RNA, and George Kaysen will actually talk about one of the discoveries from my lab um, that we found having to do with this. So these are sort of your classic, again, textbook definitions of viruses. I, as you've probably guessed, don't like these terribly much. And in fact, I've been looking for a long time to find a virus definition that I like. Um, and this is the best one that I found. It's actually also in a textbook, um, but from 1978, not from, I think this was 2008. Um, and that is Salvador Luria's definition. And now, you know, the red stuff are sort of the emphasis as opposed to things that I don't like. Sorry about not being consistent here. So viruses are entities whose genomes are elements of nucleic acid, so nucleic acid genomes, that replicate inside living cells using the cellular synthetic machinery and causing the synthesis of specialized elements. What's that specialized element called? Where's my list? Go down, find that name. The capsid or the virion, more importantly, um, that can transfer the viral genome to other cells. So do you see anything about parasite in here? No, nothing about parasites. Say anything about size? No. Do you say anything about DNA or RNA? No, just nucleic acid. So I like this definition much, much better than any of the other textbook definitions so far. And so that brings us to this, which is how I think about what a virus is. It's not just the virion, this little green thing up here, which is the you know, capsid with its nucleic acid in it. It's this whole process. It's the whole replication cycle. So you have a virion, that virion releases its nucleic acid inside a cell where it's being replicated by the cellular machinery, first making virus genomes, those then getting assembled into these specialized particles, the virions, in such a way that this whole cycle goes through. So this is a virus. It's this whole cycle here. And I like to use the analogy of a, you know, say an acorn and an oak tree. So you call an acorn a tree. No. Why should you call a virion a virus? You call a fertilized embryo a person? Well, we can, that's another philosophical question, maybe a religious one. Uh, but <laughs> uh, th these basic kinds of ideas, you know, a spore is a spore of bacteria. So I really like to think about these virions as only part of that whole 
um, virus life cycle. So finally, I'm getting the answer to your question. <laughs> Why do I study viruses? And sort of how did I get here? Um, one, viruses are everywhere. Um, in the air we breathe, in soil, in water, viruses are absolutely everywhere. And most of these are actually virions. They're not infecting any kind of cell at that particular time. When you do have an infection cycle, viruses seem to infect absolutely all cellular life. I have challenged people in the past to find a cellular organism that doesn't have a virus associated with it at some point. Certainly all of the genome sequences that we've looked at have at least partial virus genomes that are associated with them. So probably have been around for a very, very long time. Viruses are ridiculously diverse, and again, sorry with the lights here, but you know, something like this and something like this in terms of their virions, um, really ridiculously diverse. You have things, those genomes are double-stranded RNA. Huh? What the heck? So um, very, very, very diverse. And so this is part of the reason I got so interested in these things, because they're so bizarre and, and, and crazy. The other reason to study viruses, and in fact, getting back to your question, is why do, did I get into studying viruses? Um, viruses are great tools for understanding the cells that they infect. And so when we talk about the virus of Archaea, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Uh, we, we, I should say, on that one virus that I discovered, but some of my colleagues um, have found these organisms that grow in boiling acid, and we have really no idea how they can do this. Why don't we study the viruses, which are usually a much simpler mechanism, They've taken over the cell in terms of making more viruses, and so that's one of the reasons um, to do that. Um, they also make people sick, and this is a slightly old picture, but these are my two favorite viral vectors. Um, this is the one who's going to the state championship in the GOB, <laughs> um, and this one is also you know, making sure that she's not um, transmitting viruses here out on the trail. It's a few years old, this particular picture, in case any of you have seen my daughters around. So, uh, viruses, as I mentioned before, um, basically seem to infect all kinds of cellular life. Um, hopefully, this tree here means something to people. Yes, seen a tree that looks a little bit like this. People argue whether it's currently up to date. That's a whole different story that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but there are pretty clearly three major groups of organisms. Maybe you carry a branch up here with the archaea. Yeah, I know. Um, but this is a way of describing all organisms, how they're related to each other molecularly. And this is all based on the small subunit of the ribosomal RNA um, and the sequence thereof. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before that I didn't put in red because I actually believe this one um, is that translation is required to be taken as one of those cellular machineries that's being used. Well, translation, what do you need for translation? You need ribosomes, small sub in the ribosome. So you can't make a tree like this for viruses. And it turns out that making phylogenetic trees for viruses is really, really, really challenging, and nobody has a very good handle on that. And we may have a chance to talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, I like to say, because I'm kind of virocentric, that 40% of the human genome is clearly viral. That's probably an overestimation, but no one would argue that 8 to 10% of the human genome is viral. Relative to the amount of protein coding sequences, unique protein coding sequences in our genome, which is about what? It's my list. About 1.5% of the genome is unique protein coding sequences. So we're more viral than we are human, just in terms of our genomes, which is pretty amazing, I think. Again, I'm somewhat biased. Um, the other 40%, um, those are the retro elements, the reverse transcriptase elements, and some people will argue that that's where the viruses came from in the first place. Again, that's a bit of a different story. Um, some types of viruses are probably very, very old, and this is one of those examples of a type of virus that we think is really, really old, and we'll get back to that a little bit later on. Um, viruses are clearly really, really important for evolution. Basically, evolution as we know it probably would be extremely different in the absence of viruses. So let's look at a couple of examples of these. Um, how many of you have seen this picture before? Everyone can explain exactly what's on it. 
more or less. So um, this is just a sample of seawater that's been stained with a fluorescent dye that binds to nucleic acid. We have one poor eukaryote on here. It's this diatom down here. Um, each of these big dots represent the bacteria in archaea. And all the little dots are virions. Um, so these virions, which are present in basically every environment, um, if you want to count up all these little spots, all little virions, a very, very large number. Um, if you just look at ocean surface waters, which are the easiest ones to look at, but it turns out soil is extremely similar to this, anywhere between a million and 10 million virions per milliliter. That's a lot. A very, very, very large number. And if you just count the number of these dots in general, 94% um, of them are little dots, and 6% are these, and some vanishingly small amount are these um, eukaryotes. And one way to think about it, there are more virions. Again, see, I'm making a mistake here. My notes, more virions, excuse me, in a cup of seawater than there are humans on Earth. Wow. And probably also more virions in our guts than we have of cells in our body, but that's a bit of another question. Uh, you can do some back of the envelope calculations. Even at the low end, saying a million virions per milliliter in the oceans. There are a lot of milliliters of water in the ocean. So you end up with 10 to the 31 virions. That's a absolutely ridiculously large number. Um, and actually kind of incomprehensibly large. If you just assume that any of those virions are about like the bacteria of HT4, actually a little bit about half this size, and you line them all up end to end, they'd be 100 million light years long. Whoa, OK. Well, how, how do we know that we've got this many of them? And the, one of the big problems is, is, yeah, you can do these fluorescent stains and you see all these dots. But if you just look, um, this is actually, I think, my left thumb right here. Um, this is a tube of a prep of virions. Any guesses how many there are in here? No guesses. A lot. That's a decent guess. Um, so this is actually. 10 to the 10 PFUs, and we'll talk about what a PFU is a little bit later on, per mil. And there are about 10 mils in here. So this is 10 to the 11 virions in just this one tube, and you, and you can't even see them. Is this, this is, these numbers are really, really crazy. Um, human genome, um, I've shown this before, but basically it's this gray, why'd they put in gray? Uh, Retroviral-like elements, 8%. 8-10% of the human genome is really clearly vetroviral. People call these endogenous viral elements, or EVEs. I think that has something to do with the uh, Adam and Eve, et cetera, and African Eve. Um, if you look at the lines and sign elements, these retro elements present in our genomes, that's about 40% of the genome. And these are clearly related to each other, whether the retroviruses came from these retro elements or retro elements came from retroviruses is really pretty controversial. And then, yeah, what makes us human is this little tiny bit um, over here. So large amounts in our genome, turns out that pretty much any genome you look at, be a microbial genome, be an archaeal genome, be E. coli, be C. elegans, be drosophila, be mice, whatever, you find very large numbers of these viral-like elements that are present in the genomes. So another reason that we think um, viruses are potentially really, really old. There's, um, I used to say, not have the question mark at the end of the title here, um, the most genetic diversity that you find anywhere. People now are arguing about this. The quote down here at the bottom from last year. Yeah, last year. Uh, in terms of whether this is actually true. But the, the basic story, and again, this is still a little controversial, is that if you look at sequences which are coded for in some of these viral genomes, they don't look like any other sequences anybody has ever seen before. Um, one of the best studies to do this was one that looked at lots of different viruses that infected mycobacteria or the mycobacteriophage. 50% of the genes that they found in literally thousands of mycobacteriophage didn't match anything else in databases which is really kind of crazy. You, know, you sequence a new organism, whether viruses or organisms, we can talk about it again later. But 
the idea here is 50% of those genes don't match anything. Well, that's sort of a minimal estimate. Later on, people went and looked at those little dots, and they isolated the virions, and they sequenced those virions, and they found that 90% of those sequences didn't seem to match anything in databases. And then for the viruses you find in the volcanic hot springs, 95, or in some cases, 99% of the genes that you find in these virions don't match any other virus which anyone has ever seen before, or for that matter, any of the cellular um, gene sequences. So a couple of people have called this um, the dark matter of sequence space. You can make some back of the envelope calculations in terms of number of unique genes. Some people say billions. Some people say millions. I think it's just still a lot in any case. And we're not sure how much we've actually sequenced of these. Now, this being said, um, there was a paper that came out last year, which is still pretty controversial, um, by one of my colleagues, Matt Sullivan, um, who says there's only actually about 15,000 species of double-stranded DNA viruses in all of the oceans, which doesn't seem to match with this, you know, billions of unique sequences, et cetera. And so again, this is still relatively controversial, and they say this is actually a lot less than the bacteria or eukaryotic species which are present in those environments. A lot of this has to do with the relative abundance of each of those particular kinds of virions and particular kinds of things that they're infecting, and I think the jury's kind of still out on this. But if we stick with the dark matter of sequence space, why do we call it the dark matter of sequence space? This is, in fact, some data from my lab, um, from Jeff Diemer, an ex-graduate student in the lab. Um, we did some sequencing of those, again, virions and the nucleic acid we got out of those virions. 93% of them didn't match anything. And that's pretty similar to uh, dark matter and dark energy that you find in the universe. Only about 4% of it is actual visual matter. Um, RIP Stephen Hawking, as far as is concerned. So, Massive numbers, massive amounts of diversity um, at the sequence level, but also, as I've showed you already, there's really pretty massive diversity at the structural level of each of these virions. The majority of virions have this icosahedral shape. This is a high resolution structure of dengue virus. This one is cowpea chlorotic model virus that a lab that I worked in for a while has done a lot of study on poliovirus, also an icosahedral virion. All of these, actually these two, are naked viruses, and we'll talk about icosahedron and icosahedral symmetry much more later on. There are a number of viruses, and in fact the very first virus ever to be studied, tobacco mosaic virus, which is a helical virion, helically symmetric. Lots of bacterial viruses have a combination of this icosahedral symmetry and helical symmetry. If you now take an electron microscope and look at all those little dots that you found in that study of just nucleic acid stains, most of them will either look like this with a short tail, some with long tails, many, many of them with the no tail whatsoever, and quite a few really big ones still, however, icosahedrally symmetric. And then you've got some, probably the weirdest virion structure that we have for animal viruses, for myxoma, and also probably for variola, the smallpox virus. And then you go and look in the hot springs. And then you see these completely bizarre virions. Um, probably the most bizarre of them is this guy over here. This is the Ascidianus bottle-shaped virus discovered by one of my colleagues, David Prangishvili, um, also in one of these high temperature acidic environments, um, really does look like a small champagne bottle. Um, got this uh, ring of almost look like birthday candles here. This, by the way, this bar here represents 100 nanometers. So one times, or you know, 10 to the nine is a nanometer. So this would be about 10 to the seventh, 10 to the minus seventh meters um, in length here. How something like this gets put together why you see it in these environments. Completely strange, we don't understand it. Um, you also have more similar looking viruses, these icosahedral shapes, but you also have these 
very long skinny virions with these claws at one end. Here again, this bar is 100 nanometers. This virion is actually twice the size of the cell that it infects. So the poor cell is only about a micron, but the virion is two microns in length. How the heck this can infect that kind of cell and still replicate, again, is still a very open question. It has these interesting claws at the end. These actually will close down onto pili, which are coming to the outside of the cell in order for infection to take place. And then my current favorite, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not, um, the one I've been working on for 20 years, kind of frightening, actually, no, 22 years now, um, are these SSV, sulfalobus, spindle-shaped virus. They have this sort of a lemon shape with a short tail at one end, um, and this is just a little bit of cellular debris. I'm particularly proud of this image because it was also one that, that I took. So I told you why I study viruses. They're ridiculously diverse in terms of sequence, in terms of structure, et cetera. But there are other things that people are really excited about studying viruses for. And this is um, also from Salvador Luria, which is not just a reason for studying viruses for studying viruses' sake, but just really to try and understand life in general. So as an intrinsic simplicity of nature and the ultimate contribution of science resides in the discovery of unifying and simplifying generalizations. So that's what we're really going to be talking about. Yes, we're going to talk about individual viruses and how they replicate, but really important those unifying and simplifying processes and generalizations rather than description of in isolated situations and simple overall patterns, rather than the analysis of patchworks. Um, anybody listen to NPR? I have your numbers here this morning. They talked about you know, humans really liking patterns and really liking explanations for things, even though there's a huge amount of randomness in our lives and the universes, et cetera. So um, we are going to try, anyway, to think about these unifying and simplifying generalizations. But of course, Stedman loves to ask exam questions about you know, isolated situations and all of the exceptions. So there are a couple of open questions um, that <clears throat> I wanted to mention here. A few of them are in the textbook as well. We're not going to get answers to these questions anytime soon, and certainly not through the rest of this course. One of the really fundamental ones is, where do viruses come from? Sort of a chicken and egg question. You know, was it the virus first? Was it the cell first? No. And how do you make that definition? Well, currently we say all viruses have to infect cells, but maybe there's something like a virus before there were cells. I think it's a really interesting question. Why do viruses even continue to exist? If you use the parasitic definition, they're all parasites. So over probably billions of years of evolution, uh, why do we still have these parasites around? Seems like a rather strange process, unless maybe in some evolutionary cases they're actually doing something which is reasonably good. So one of the corollaries of this is that virulent viruses, things that make you really, really sick and really kill your host, are probably relatively new, evolutionarily speaking, because if you think about it from the virus's point of view, if you're dependent on a host and you kill off a host, that's not a really good way to survive, is it? On the other hand, viruses that can hang out in their hosts for long periods of time, or maybe even integrate into their genome, those are probably going to persist a heck of a lot longer, certainly from an evolutionary scale. So um, there's this whole question of, you know, are viruses good? And that brings us to perfect timing to look at the Edge of Life, the movie. I will let you take a look at this uh, later. Again, the link is here. Um, this is the trailer for the documentary movie that I was trying to make. Um, just ignore the part at the end which says, coming soon, 2012. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will see you all on Wednesday.